The big question we're looking at today is uh, what are you asking? What are you asking? And the reason that's really the title of the message today is um, we're, we're going to talk today about asking thoughtful questions in order that we can have intentional conversations with people in our, our circles, people in our neighborhood, people in our school, what have you, because we're finishing up a series today of messages that we have been calling what? On belay. On belay, right? And uh, so this is the last in that series of messages. And this is what we've talked about. Um, we started with why. You on belay. In other words, that's you saying, and I know you've heard me say this the last five weeks, but it's you saying, Jesus, I want to be on mission with you. And that's a different approach than so many people that are part of just the church nationwide, worldwide. So often we engage with the church in a way that says, you know, feed me right? Which is what a church should do. But beyond that, we want to say to Jesus, Lord, I want to be on mission with you. I don't, I don't want to have just a Sunday morning experience. I want to have a Monday through Saturday experience as well, where I'm on mission with you, where I am, feel, I am believing that I am a sent one into my community, my workplace, my school. So we started with why. You are on belay, right? And if you're new here, the word belay, what does it mean? It's a mountain climbing term. You're helping people ascend. You're helping people go up, get higher, right? And so that's kind of the, what we're talking about. But we're talking about getting close to Jesus. So then we said, how are we going to do that? B stands for bless. And I want to challenge you today is to think about how can you bless three people every week? Just at the beginning of the week, today is the beginning of the week, right? Sunday and say, Lord, this week I want to bless three people. Uh, would there be three people that you would bring to my mind that I can be a blessing to? And uh, Lord, help me. Help me pray for those people this week. Uh, e stands for eat. And I want to challenge you um, here in the last message of this series to say, I want to eat with peop three people this week. And uh, you can do it all at once. You can say, I'm going to invite three people to lunch, or I'm going to have uh, three different gatherings with people, eating with them. And why are we doing this? Because that's what Jesus did, right? Jesus was known as a glutton and a and a drunkard because he was eating and drinking with people all the time. In fact, we talked in that, in that message we talked about in the book of Luke, it seems that Jesus is either going to a meal, eating a meal, or coming from a meal all through the entire book of Luke. Um, last week, we talked about learning Christ, all right, learning the ways of Jesus. And practically, that means we're getting our, getting our, getting a habit of reading the Bible on a regular basis. You know, we're, we're, we're practicing listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I want to challenge you to do that three times a week, right? You're engaging with the Bible. You're purposing to say, I want to learn the character and the person of Christ. And then today we're going to talk about asking questions, that this is a habit that we would develop to be somebody that shows genuine curiosity in our, neighbor, you know, in our neighbors, their lives, what's going on. So that's, that's the idea today. And so I want to group the types of conversations that we would have into four different categories. All right? Four different categories. And I see these categories modeled in a conversation that Jesus had between himself and two of his disciples in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, I want to set it up just a little bit, what's going to happen in that chapter. So Jesus... He's just risen from the dead. And at the beginning of Luke 24, a few of the women, I think it's Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, that's what Matthew says, at least in his gospel, they go to the tomb to bring spices to bury the body of Jesus or to, you know, anoint or whatever, prepare. Um, I don't know what they, his body is already there, but just to bring spices for his body. But he's gone. He's already raised from the dead. They see an angel. The angel said he's not here. He has risen. And so the women go and tell the disciples. So Peter and John, they also go to see the body of Jesus, which is not there. So they don't know what to do with this. And they're feeling like they don't quite believe that he's risen from the dead yet. And then Luke brings us this story. Okay, Luke 24, 13 to 35, it says, Now that same day, right, the same day that people are discovering the tomb is empty, that same day, two of them, two of the disciples, we don't know what their names, well, we, we, we do find out some of their names later on. So they're not one of the 12. They're not two of the 12. They're just two of the followers of Jesus. Um, they were going to a village, village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And so seven miles, how long would that take you to hike? A couple hours, right? So you got a couple hour walk. What was that? I would turn around. I wouldn't. 
<laughs> you, you could do it. You could do it. Yeah, you could do it. There's a great seven mile hike. I know a uh, table, what's it called? Table Mesa, 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 Mesa trail, Mesa trail. You can, you can do like a seven miles. We did that with, uh, where's Matt? Yeah, we did that with Matt about a year ago or so, something like that. Yeah, it was a couple hours, two, three hours. Um, so they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And so they just finished the passion week. Jesus was crucified, buried. That's all they know at this point. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Which isn't that a beautiful phrase right there, right? Jesus came up, walked along with them, which is what we're called to do. We're called to walk alongside people. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Keep in mind, he's the God of the universe, but he's, he's showing curiosity. I love that. They stood still. They stopped, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here in these days? In other words, like, have you been under a rock, right? And so Jesus, still curious, says, what things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And here's verse 21. It says, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. That would have been Peter and John. But they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with, the, with Moses and the prophets and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. How many would like to hear a two-hour long sermon by Jesus? <laughs> that would have been pretty amazing, right? Um, verse 28 says, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at their table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned to, to, at once to Jerusalem where they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen from, it risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. Okay, so here's the four types of I'm going to call them intentional conversations that I see Jesus doing and I believe we can engage in as well. All right. And it's going to be, I'm going to show you a graphic here. So four types of conversation. Number one, I actually numbered these wrong. Number one should be surface. Number two should be story. Number three is spiritual. And number four is salvation. All right. Surface, story, spiritual, and salvation. Let's, let's pray first. Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn from you in this story in Luke 24 about how we can be missional and intentional and filled with purpose as we engage with a culture that thinks they know what the church is like. They think they know what Christianity is like. But Lord, help us to have patient, curious hearts that are willing to navigate conversations, to bring light and life to the conversations that we have. So help us, Lord, to, to learn from you this morning about how you conversed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the first kind of conversation uh, we're going to look at is surface conversation. And it's just like it sounds. It's talking about things that are hopefully not offensive, 
because it's at the surface, but in today's culture, it's hard to know, right? Even, sometimes even surface things can, can, even, can cause offense, and so I get that. But the idea of surface conversation is talking about stuff that's kind of non-threatening at the surface. And I see Jesus actually model this for us in the message we just, in the passage we just read. Um, verse 15 to 17, it says, As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked among them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And we don't know why. We don't know how that worked. God can do that, right? God can do that if he wants. And so we don't know if a supernatural thing was happening. Not sure what else happened, how, why they couldn't recognize him. But verse 17, he says, what are you discussing together as you walk along? In other words, it's like Jesus comes up to them and says, what, what's up, guys, right? What are you talking about? What, what's going on? Um, Jesus showed, specifically, he showed interest in what they were interested in. He showed curiosity about what was going on in their life. Um, so Patty goes to swimming like three times a week, twice a week. And the name of your group that you swim with is what? The Sirens. The Sirens, okay? <laughs> so she, she goes to the East, East Boulder Rec Center and she swims with a group of ladies. And she, you're one of the youngest. I'm the youngest. You are the youngest. <laughs> So a group of um, some older ladies, what, yeah. 60s, and two men, yeah. or two no, or three, more is there more, more than that? that? Yeah. So anyway, her, her, her sirens came over and had lunch with us last week or a week, last Friday, something like that. And I don't know, there was 30-some ladies in here and two guys. <laughs> um, I, don't know if the guy, I don't know if the guys go by sirens, you know, I don't know if I would want to go by sirens. But anyway, um, <laughs> mermen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a bunch of sirens and two mermen, um, we'll say that. Um, and I had a delightful conversation with a guy probably in his 60s named Perry. And, of course, I'd never met Perry, but I soon discovered that Perry was a scuba diver. And I've never scuba dived. I don't know anything about scuba diving. Um, I've gone snorkeling a couple times, but have never gone scuba diving. Which is, which is the beautiful thing about deciding you're going to develop a habit of just asking questions, right? Because it was actually a benefit that I didn't have anything, I didn't know anything about scuba diving because I could ask Perry questions. Oh, that's interesting. Where have you dived? Where have you dove? Dove? <laughs> divin? Yeah. Dived before? I'm not sure how you say that. Where have you gone diving? Where have you gone diving before? And found out he's, he's, he's gone diving all over the world. He's gone down, he's been in Mexico, he's been in South America, he's been you know, over across the other side of the globe. And then, um, oh wow, how long do you have to train to do that? Um, uh, do you ever get nervous when you do that? And then I thought of a movie, a couple of movies I've seen. Oh, did you see that movie about the, uh, the 12 or so, I think it was more than that, 18, I think, uh, Thai soccer players that were trapped in an underground cave. Oh yeah, yeah. I saw, you know, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that yet. But I heard about the story, and I said, "Would you ever do that? You know, would you dive through the?" He's like, "No, you know, that would." So we were able to have this conversation about scuba diving, and he, and here's just a real simple equation that I really believe that it's this: showing interest is basically the same thing as showing love. Just showing curiosity, showing interest equals showing love. And so if we go back to the conversation that Jesus is having with these two. Notice that Jesus does not walk up and say, and I'm not saying anything is wrong with what I'm about to say because there's a place. I, I respect people that have the boldness to do this. But Jesus, that day, he did not walk up and say, do the two of you know where you will spend eternity? <laughs> right? <laughs> do the two of you know where you're going to spend eternity? That's, that's not what he said. He literally just walked up and said, hey, guys, what's up? What are you talking about? What are you discussing together as you walk along? And here's a couple of other thoughts just to kind of help us think about this. Um, you know, what did God create? Do you know what God created during the first six days of creation? What was, what was day one? Do you know what day one was? Let there be light. Day two, he separated the light from the dark. Day three, he separated the land and the sea. Yeah. And then he also covered the land with green plants. Day four, he created the sun, moon, and stars. Yep. Day five, he created the fish, sea creatures. Day six, he created the animals, and then finally us. And here's why I point this out. 
I just find it interesting that God spent a lot of time preparing the surface before he created the people. And I take this as permission as somebody who wants to be on mission with Jesus, that it's okay to spend time preparing the surface. To prepare the surface, getting to know somebody's name. It's said that one of the most beautiful things in anybody's ear is their own name, right? Just hearing their name, being friendly, showing interest. And then think about this. If you look at the globe from space and you zero in on one of the continents, what's the most predominant color you see from space? green. If you're looking at a continent, yeah, the most predominant color is green, right? And why do we need all that green? What does it do for us? It gives us air, provides oxygen, right? Yeah, feeds us, but yeah, it, it's, and that's what I think of a service conversation, right? It gives oxygen to relationship. It gives us something that I can go to. When I see Perry again, I can say, hey, where have you been scuba diving lately, right? I can remember that. I can remember his name. So I'm going to give you two minutes, two minutes for this next screen. Turn to somebody near you and ask these two questions. What's your name and what's an interesting fact about you that I probably don't know yet? Okay, who learned an interesting fact that it's okay to share? Anybody have a really interesting fact? Okay, so this, this is Sam, everybody. Um, I saw um, a fox one time. Whoa, really? Yeah, the baby one. A baby fox? Yeah. Wow. Sam, so Samuel saw a baby fox. Everybody give him a hand. All right. That's cool. All right. Well, we'll move, we'll move on. The next, the next kind of conversation is, or the intentional conversation is a story conversation. Okay, so at the surface, what do we know? We know their name. We know maybe some interesting facts. But story conversation happens when we go below the surface and we hear a person's story. Okay, their story would include things like their hopes, um, their dreams, their fears, their struggles, their hurts, their aspirations. And uh, it makes me think, um, I, I, didn't even, I hadn't even given any of this any thought. I think the Lord just helped me stumble into it. Um, when we were pastoring in, uh, not even, we weren't even pastoring yet. I was actually just kind of shadowing the pastor of the church in Beijing before I became the pastor there. And there was a pastor on staff as well, whose name was Danny. And it seemed like Danny was just kind of at odds with a lot of people. And uh, the, the pastor I was shadowing under, um, his name is John, and John and Danny weren't getting along very well. And, and so I'm just kind of sitting back wondering, what's, you know, I wonder what's going on. So rather than just adopting other people's stories about the situation, I remember I went and had coffee. We went to a a coffee shop in Beijing, and I sat down with Danny, and, and I don't know, I, I, I could almost imagine that Danny might have been slightly on the defensive, but the first thing out of my mouth when we actually sat down is I said, so Danny, I want to understand better. Can you just tell me your story? And, uh, and he just kind of, kind of lit up, and I could tell he was impacted by it, and he, he talked with me for like an hour, told me his story. And uh, so Danny and I had a good relationship. And I remember four or five years later when, when we were about to leave, Danny found me and he said, thank you so much just for giving me the opportunity to tell you my story. He said that meant so much to me. It was so encouraging just having you say what's your story. And, and that's what Jesus does. Jesus actually models a willingness to hear their story in this passage that we just read. Verse 17 he asked them, we already said this, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, again, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And yeah, I think there was emotion in his voice, right? But listen what Jesus says. Remember, the God of the universe shows curiosity and he says in verse 19, what things? What things, he asked. And they said, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And here's their story. Okay, here's their story. It comes out. Jesus just says what things, and their story is this. We had hoped. We had been looking forward to this Jesus and what he was going to do our entire life. We had, we had given everything over. That, that's what's behind these words, right? Jesus was supposed to liberate our people. 
We'd hoped for this. We'd hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's already the third day since all this took place. And so the conversation went from surface to story. And all Jesus had to say is, tell me more. Right? What things? Uh, How did that make you feel? Um, What's the whole story? I want to hear it. And and that simple question leads into the disciples uttering this really heartbreaking phrase, we had hoped. And that's what a person's story is wrapped up in. It's it's wrapped up in maybe a dashed hope, a hope that they're still longing for. And I just wonder how close people are to talking about their hopes if we will just be patient enough to ask them timely questions. And not difficult questions. Just tell me more. What's the story? How did that make you feel, right? You know, Jesus, it said, asked over 300 questions in four Gospels, which means that's an average of 75 questions per Gospel. And, you know, the Gospels don't have a ton of chapters. They're not super long. So Jesus is just always asking questions. And I want to show you a few examples. I'm going to read them out loud. Here's the questions. These are just a few of them. What is your name? These are all Jesus asking. What do you want me to do for you? Why are you so afraid? Do you believe I'm able to do this? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to his life? What did you go out into the desert to see? Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Have you understood all these things? Why did you doubt? Who do people say the son of man is? Who do you say I am? How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? What do you think? <laughs> I like that's a good one, right? How long should I put up with you? Um, what do you think about the Messiah? Do you, th- do you see all of these things? Do you still have no faith? Why don't you believe me? And I want you to notice a couple of things. Jesus doesn't ask combative questions. I think of combative questions or questions like, says who, right? <laughs> or prove it. Can you prove it? Jesus didn't ask yes or no questions, but Jesus asked thought-provoking questions that took people below the surface into their story. All right, so we're going to practice again. I'm going to give you three minutes this time. What's the strangest thing you know about your family history? What's a phrase you'd like to have etched on your tombstone? Or what would you like to be true of you in 10 years? Okay, just pick one. One. Three minutes. If it's okay, do anybody want to share something that they learned? Okay, Bertie. Carter wants to go to her school business someday. Oh, nice. <laughs> so Bertie learned that Carter would like to go to her school of business where she teaches. So the third type of conversation is spiritual conversation. So if you walked outside right now, if you walked outside right now, the predominant color would be what? I heard green. But actually, wouldn't it be blue? Right? Depends on where you're looking. looking. Good. And I love that. You guys illustrated it perfectly. Um, Yeah, when we go outside, the natural answer, the first answer would be green. But actually, the predominant color outside is blue. And the reason we don't think of it is because we we don't walk around looking up. Right? We don't walk around. We don't bike around looking up. What's going to happen? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to crash. So we, we look ahead, right? And so this, it reminds me that much of life is actually spiritual. And we were talking about this around the dinner table last night. Christian was here as well as um, Ricky and, and his family. Talking about how much of life is actually spiritual, but we actually don't notice because our, our, our brains are often focused on what's in front of us. What's, what feels important, and we ignore the, the spiritual. And so a couple of passages come to mind. I think of uh, the Old Testament patriarch Jacob. When Jacob encountered God for the first time, when he became aware of God's reality, in Genesis 28, 16, he says, when Jacob woke up from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't aware of it, right? God's been here. There's been a spiritual reality and I'm not, I haven't been aware of it. And then, and then the writer of Hebrews, um, he reminds us of this ever-present reality and truth of the spiritual realm when he says this, or she says, some people say it, Hebrews could have been a, a woman or a man, we're not sure, we don't know who wrote it. It says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Amazing, right? 
what, what, a, what a thing to think about, that you perhaps have encountered angels and we don't even know it. What a, what a thought. So here's the point of a spiritual conversation. The point is, is that maybe God will use us to help our neighbors shift their focus up. And rather than just seeing what's happening here, that they will maybe shift their focus and begin to see, oh, there's more to this life. There's more to what's happening. And so in Jesus's conversation with the two disciples, watch how quickly the conversation actually gets more spiritual. Verse 22, it says, in addition, they're talking now, the two disciples, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. So now they're talking about a resurrection of a body. Wow. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, visions, angels, who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And so the conversation just very quickly going from surface, hey guys, what's up? To story, tell me more, right? What's, what, what's, what's been happening? To spiritual. All because, it's all because Jesus was just showing some curiosity. That's all it was. Just curiosity. And how beautiful if we are willing in our culture and in here in Boulder just to show curiosity. I think sometimes as Christians we want to be quick to bring correction. And we want to be quick to say, oh, let me, let me correct you on that point, right? Why not just be curious? Jesus just continues to show this beautiful curiosity. And so here's a few tips about how I think we can shift things into the spiritual. Um, tip number one would be, I think we talked about this a little bit last night when, uh, when we were at the dinner table, um, is stop using that, well, I'm not in church filter. Okay? I'm not in church filter. And the I'm not in church filter means that we talk one way in church because we know everybody is kind of on the same page for the most part. And so we, could, we talk about prayer. We talk about things God is doing in our life. But why not, why not talk about what God is doing in our life to anybody? Right? Why, not, why not do that? And this house has given us so many opportunities to shift conversations spiritual because somebody will say, wow, what a beautiful house that you have or you own. And we say, oh, wait, let me tell you something. Well, we don't actually own this house. It belongs to a very generous couple in China. And they felt God told them to buy this house and let us use it for a church. And, you know, and why not use that opportunity? I don't pretend like the house is mine. I don't pretend that I bought it because they're not church people that I'm talking to. No, I, we tell them that it was a miracle that God provided. And tip number two, just ask people, hey, can I pray for you right now? Can I pray for you? And that's what we're going to practice. I'm going to give you two to three minutes. Ask somebody, say, how can I pray for you? And then pray. Okay? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, cool. Um, I want to tell you, I just thought of this. Um, when we were in China, we went with a group of uh, students, I think high school students, to a, um, I call it a nursing home, maybe, like a retirement village. And those aren't very common in China. Um, and the Chinese, those of you who are Chinese in here, correct me if I'm, anything I say is wrong here. But um, for the most part, when people get older in China, they go live with their family. So somebody who lives in a, a retirement home often doesn't have family for one reason or the other, or they're at odds with family. So they can be very lonely places. And we were at this retirement village. And I remember I was sitting in a walkway um, with a few of the students, and a nurse came up to me with an elderly gentleman um, helping him walk along. And she came up to us and she said, he wants to know, what do you do for dizziness? In other words, like the question really was, uh, if somebody is suffering from dizziness, what good medicine would you suggest? And I remember in that moment, there was a nervousness about, you know, what are we able to do here? You know, what can we say? What are we free to say? And so the first thing out of my mouth, <laughs> I feel embarrassed about it now, was, you know, make sure you get plenty of rest and drink lots of water. And, um, and, I, and I just thought in my head, that was kind of dumb. And I said, <laughs> you said, you know what? Can I just pray for you? Can I pray for your dizziness? And they gave me permission. And I think that the nurse looked a little nervous about it, but they both said I could do that. And, I, and he only spoke Chinese, and my Chinese, when it came to pray, praying, was pretty limited. So my prayer was, if I can remember, Toyin uh, Zhou. So dizziness, go, take a hike. Yesu um, Qinglai, right? Jesus, come. 
Uh, no, I said healing come. How would you say healing? I don't know I said healing come. And then I said, in the name of Jesus. Fung yesu de ming. Amen. So dizziness go, Jesus come. In Jesus' name, amen. And then a bell rang, and it was time for us to go, like, to a different spot. And so we all scattered. And I was in the cafeteria, and this nurse and this elderly gentleman started walking toward me pretty rapidly. And they got up to me, and she says to me, he wants to know the words that you used. What was, what was that word? Almost like what was the incantation that you used? And I said, I, I don't remember exactly you know, what I said exactly. And she, she says, well, he wants to know because he's been dizzy for the last 11 years, and he's not dizzy now. <laughs> he's, been, he's been healed. And I said, uh, and I said, I said to him, I said, I don't remember at that point exactly what I said, but I said, the most important thing is, is that we talk to Jesus and, and Jesus actually healed you. You know, it wasn't the words, but we, we asked Jesus to do this and he did that. And so I remember we went over and sat down at a table and we were talking about God. And, and I, I, I recited to him John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And I said, so what do you think? In my broken Chinese, I said, do you believe in Jesus? And he's basically said, how couldn't I? He just healed me, <laughs> right? And so that's the beauty about uh, the spiritual conversation is that can really lead quickly into this last type of conversation that I'm going to call a salvation conversation. Salvation conversation. And the key difference between a spiritual conversation and a salvation conversation is Jesus. Okay, that's, that's the big difference. Because spirituality covers a lot, right? Yeah. But Jesus brings it in to this very next level kind of conversation where maybe people are willing to talk about the supernatural, but Jesus becomes either attractive or offensive, right? Paul says we are the smell of death to some, we're the smell of life to others. But there's this place where we have this Jesus, this salvation conversation. Let's not be afraid to go there when God begins to set it up for us anyway. And so that's what Jesus does. Watch Jesus take the conversation from a spiritual conversation about angels, about visions, and now he's talking about himself, the Messiah. He said to them, and watch the boldness in his conversation, how foolish you are, right? The Holy Spirit can come on us in boldness where we can speak very boldly in a salvation conversation. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah so we're not talking about just a generic God. We're talking about the Messiah, the one who came to save our sins. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going to go further. And so even though he had just called them fools, they didn't get offended. You know, we might think, oh, people are going to get offended. They didn't get offended. Verse 29, it says, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them, but he was at the table with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And I wonder sometimes if it's not because they had seen Jesus break bread with people so often. They're like, when, he, when they saw him break their bread, that's the Jesus I remember. The eating Jesus, right? The eating and drinking Jesus. And he disappeared from their sight, and they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And I think of another young couple, in, um, our, our young couple also during our time in Beijing. Um, his name is Ji Zhong. Ji Zhong was Chinese, and Xi Jing. Xi Jing was Korean. And they wanted to get married, and so they came to our house. We sat at that very table but it was in Beijing at that time. We sat at that table, and I said, well, Ji Zhong, uh, I, don't, I, I personally don't have the freedom to marry somebody, a couple, when you know, you're both not Christians. I said, Xi Jing is a Christian, but you're not. And uh, you know, what are we going to do about this? And he, 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 he said, uh, yeah, I've always just struggled with you know, the idea of creation and all of that. And I said, you know, Ji Zhong, Let's put that aside right now. I said, the most important thing that you need to worry about or think about is what are you going to do about Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? And I said, can I just share with you um, four spiritual truths that I think you need to understand so you know what it means to be a Christian? And he's like, yeah. And uh, different people call them different things, four spiritual laws, four spiritual truths. If you've never heard them, this is what I shared with Ji Jong that day. I said, number one, Ji Jong, you need to know that God loves you. 
and he desires to have a relationship with you. And that's true for each one of you here today as well. All right. And number two, I said, Ji Jong, your sin is standing in the way. I said, do you know what sin is? And we had a conversation about sin. You know, sin is just doing things that God, that God doesn't like, right? That grieves God's heart. Um, yeah, I won't go deep into that. Just think of the Ten Commandments, breaking God's law. Your sin stands in the way. But I said, G. Jong, number three, I want you to understand that Jesus paid the price for your sins on the cross, okay? You should have been punished for your sins, but Jesus said, I will take the punishment in G. Jong's place. I will take the punishment in, my, in Paul's place. I will go to the cross. And then number four, I said, G. Jong, through faith in Jesus, you can be saved, right? Through trusting in Jesus, he, can, he will save you by trusting in him. And I, I think of this, uh, this, this passage in John chapter 11, verse 25. It says, Jesus said to Martha, Martha, one of the followers of Jesus, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says to Martha. Verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, who is to come into the world. And that's actually what I asked Ji Jong at the end. I said, Ji Jong, what do you think? Do you believe this? And I said, you don't have to tell me now. I want you to go. I want you to leave. You know, when you leave tonight, I want you to think about this. But in th by three days, in three days, I want you to get back to me. I want you to send me a text and tell me what your decision is. So three days went by and Ji Jong never texted me. And I was sad and I thought, well, I guess he's made his, made his decision. And, uh, but day four, he actually sent me a text. He said, Sorry, this is late, but I want to believe in Jesus. You know, can, you, can, you, can we get together again? And so we got together again, and we kind of walked through those same sport, spiritual laws and truths, and Jesus, I mean, Ji Jong put his faith in Jesus. And the cool thing, what I, what I believe in doing, and I, I, this is what I did with Ji Jong. I said, Ji Jong, here's what you need to do. You need to, you need to pray. Tell Jesus that you need him. Tell Jesus you believe in him. Tell Jesus you trust in him. I'm not going to lead you. I want to hear you pray it yourself. And that's exactly what Ji Jong did. He just said, okay, dear God, you know, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe that I'm a sinner and I believe that you forgive me. Would you come into my life? And amen. And I remember, you know, it was, there was a lot of people in our church and it, I would go for months without, see, without seeing Ji Jong. And I would think, Lord, have, have I dropped the ball? But I remember even like two years later, G. Jung came to me and he says, hey, I've been reading in Matthew. I've been reading with, you know, I've been, I've been leading a, a study at my office. And I'm like, wow. He just, he just began to grow, begin to soak up God's spirit. So now I ask you, you know, I ask you, do you believe this? You know, this is our salvation conversation right now. Do you believe this? Do you believe like Martha? Do you believe like G. Jung that Jesus, like Martha said, is the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world, who went to the cross, who gave his life, raised to life three days later. Have you put your faith in that? And if you're in a place where you say, I'm not sure, but I want to, just like Ji Jong did, I want to encourage you the same way I did Ji Jong, talk to God, okay, have that conversation. Say, Jesus, I want to begin a relationship with you today, all right? Would you help me with that? And then tell somebody. If you do that, tell somebody that you did that. Okay, so let's review four types of questions. Um, the first one was, not, again, my numbers are wrong. First one was surface. Surface is we're just showing curiosity. Let's just be curious. Okay, let's just be curious. Let's learn names. Let's remember the names. And then the story, what's going on below the surface? I find this helps me so much to not get offended when I remember that people have some stuff going on below the surface, right? We see the outward statements, we see the posts on social media, but what's going on below the surface? Let's be curious enough to find out why. Um, and then spiritual conversation is, Lord, help us to help people look up, not to Christianity, not to church, because if they do that, they're gonna get upset, and we know that, we've heard that, it's all over social media, right? People get upset at Christians at church. Well, let's help people look up instead. And then the salvation question salvation conversation. I encourage you to become familiar with just simple ways of leading people into understanding what it means to follow Jesus, whether it's the four spiritual laws or truths or the ABCs of salvation. Just, it's easy just to get educated on 
how can I help people understand what it means to really be a follower of Jesus? Okay. Um, I made something that is just like this screen. So this is just a, uh, this is a piece of paper. It's actually on our website. And the idea, the way this works is you would say, Lord, these are people that I've had like a surface conversation with, and I'm going to write their name down. And Lord, would you help me have a story conversation with them now? You know, give me the boldness, give me the opportunity to have a story conversation. And then Lord, once they've had a story conversation, Lord, how can I have a spiritual conversation with them? And pray, Lord, help me to move that name. And this is just something you can keep in your Bible, keep by your bedside. So those are at um, belay.church forward slash media. And if you just look for today's message, you can find that, that sheet to download. Okay? All right. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be on mission with you. That's why we've been spending these last few weeks learning how to do that, learning just simple ways, whether it be uh, just blessing other people, um, choosing to share a meal with them, um, spending time in your word, just learning the ways of Jesus, learning Christ. Um, and Father, help us just to do the simple thing of just showing curiosity, just asking questions, not feeling like we have to just... Uh, drop some serious knowledge and wisdom on people. Um, help us just to invite conversation. Just invite them to share their story, their thoughts, what's on their heart. Give us boldness just to say, can I pray for you about that? Yeah. And Lord, help us to expect miracles. Um, even our simple prayers where we don't feel like they're all right and correct, but Lord, I pray that you would spoil uh, the people in our communities just with answered prayers and miracles and healings just because we just say, can I pray for you about that? And Lord, we do pray for those opportunities of salvation conversations where we can help people understand what it means to walk into a relationship with you. And Father, for those in this room here today that maybe don't have that born again relationship with you, Father, I pray that they would have that conversation with you today too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.